you are turned in your Bibles there to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. We'll begin there in verses 31 down through verse 42. This morning, what I want to do for you, what I want to draw out of this passage is what I believe is already there. And I'll tell you that this is the commitment of our church family and specifically of the the teachers, of the preachers here in our church family. It is to draw out of the text of Scripture what is already there to draw out of the text of Scripture what is already there. This is the practice known as exegesis, the drawing out of what is already there, not eisegesis. Eisegesis is reading into a passage what is not there. We ought not do that, but we practice exegetical teaching, exegetical preaching. It is also another way it is called expository preaching. Expository preaching is, literally means to, to shed light, to expose. And really the task of true preaching is to expose the text of Scripture as it was written, as it was meant to be understood, and as it is always meant to be applied. So hopefully this morning you are helped to understand Scripture, to apply it, to live it out in your life. And I hope... That as the outcome of this sermon that you will have an even greater and even deeper appreciation of the Lord Jesus, of his work in your heart, of the ability that you have to believe, of the faith that you have in him, that you will understand the origin of faith. In this passage, I think that there are three observations to be made on the origin of faith. Three observations on the origin of faith. You'll see that unfold. In fact, you'll see it be drawn right out of the passage of Scripture. A little bit of background as we begin to look at our passage. There in the previous paragraph, we we saw Jesus in Jerusalem, still in Jerusalem, during the Feast of Dedication. That is, during those eight days known also as Hanukkah the celebration of the rededication of the temple there in Jerusalem when the Jews came back into Jerusalem and took control of it once more. And they cleansed the temple. Judas Maccabeus cleansed the temple and they commemorated that on a yearly basis, celebrating that during what is known as the Feast of Dedication. And it was there at the Feast of Dedication that all the people began to gather around Jesus in the temple complex and specifically in the colonnade of Solomon, in Solomon's portico. That means the porch of Solomon in a covered area during winter time. It's cold and the, we- the weather is unfavorable. So they gather around him and Jesus began to teach. And in fact, uh, Jesus called the people to believe in him. They're sitting there asking him, if you're the Christ, if you're the anointed of God, if you're supposed to be our king, would you just tell us plainly? And he says, I did tell you. I've told you these things already. The very works, the miracles, the signs that I've been performing, they bear witness that I've been sent by the Father. But you do not believe, Jesus says, because you are not among my sheep. On the contrary, he says, my sheep, they hear my voice. I know them. He says, I I, I know my sheep. They know me. They believe me. And no one is able to snatch them out of my hand. Then he says, my Father, who's greater than all, has them. He's given them to me, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. This is, this is, as I said last week, it may be the single greatest comforting set of verses that Christ has given to his people. The, the eternal security that Jesus and the Father in perfect unity provide the children of God. And then Jesus says something to speak of this perfect unity. And you read it there in verse 30 of chapter 10. He says, I and the Father are one. Perfect unity. Not not a, a beam of daylight between the two. Two and yet one. In fact, three and yet one. Father, Son, and Spirit. 
I and the Father are one. Did the listeners understand what Jesus was saying when he uttered this? In fact, they did. They knew that Jesus was claiming to be God. They knew that Jesus was claiming deity. He's claiming divinity. And so they have an issue with this. In fact, they understand that Jesus is claiming to be the Son of God. Claiming to be the Son of God. So, as we look at this passage, what we see is a reaction. We see a reaction. I feel like I probably need to pause because nobody's paying attention. Let's just take a moment. As you saw, Ms. Gwen fell just a moment ago, and I believe that's what all of our medical personnel are dealing with. I'm gonna go ahead and pause, and we're gonna take a moment as a church family, and we're going to pray for Ms. Gwen, and then we'll hand it all over as it already is into the hands of the Lord, okay? If you will, men, if you're able, could you take a knee with me? Our Father in heaven, we submit now that, Lord, we're concerned for our sister. Lord, we want to see her cared for, taken care of, healthy and healed. And Father, we know that you've gifted this church with many uh, medical personnel. We pray that you would, uh, Lord, give them understanding. Uh, Lord, give them the ability to give the help to Miss Gwen as she needs it. Father, for those who um, will be ministering to her, Lord, I pray that you would give them insight, give them understanding as to how best to uh, take care of her. Lord, we cast our cares upon you, and we do ask that the, prayer, the, the peace that surpasses understanding would guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. We pray above all that you would glorify your name. We pray that you would give great comfort to our sister and give her peace. We pray that you would help us Lord, to, to honor you even now, even in this time. Lord, as we think of her, as we think of those who are caring for her, Lord, as we desire for her to be helped and healed. Lord, I pray, Lord, that whatever you have designed to accomplish this morning, Lord, that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. We know that you are perfect and wise in all things, and we trust you. We pray these things in the name of Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, not to be insensitive, but there's only so much that we can do, and so I would ask you to join me again as we preach. And Lord, be with us. He'll give us understanding in his word and we'll glorify him this morning as you keep Ms. Gwen in your prayers and on your heart. As I said, Jesus has just equated himself with the Father. He's equated himself as deity by saying, I and the Father are one. Is this what the people understood Jesus to mean? Yes, it is. Because you see their reaction in verse 31. You see their reaction. They, they want to stone Jesus. They want to put him to death for what he has just said. In fact, they accuse him of blasphemy. What you see in verse 31 through 39, the first section that we'll address, is you see the blindness of unbelief. The blindness of unbelief. Jesus makes this clear statement. And he's made even clearer statements by the works that he's done. But the people who have their eyes wide open in front of Jesus cannot see. And why can they not see? They cannot see because they are unbelievers. And their unbelieving manifests that and shows it. They're blind. But in verse 40 through 42, you see that not everyone is blind. That there actually are those in this passage who can see Jesus, who see Jesus truly as he is, equal with the Father, one with the Father. 
divinity clothed in humanity, God in the flesh, Emmanuel. Whereas in verse 31 through 39, we see the blindness of unbelief. In verse 40 through 42, we see the sight of true belief. The sight of true belief. Now pay attention with me and follow along carefully because I think these three observations are going to be massively helpful for your love of God, for your worship of God. They're going to deepen your relationship and your appreciation of God in worship. So let's look real quick at these verses before us. Verses 31 through 39, the blindness of unbelief. Again, Jesus has just said, I and the Father are one. Here's the response, verse 31. The Jews picked up stones again. Don't miss that. They've already tried to stone him twice. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from my Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? Pardon me, they've tried to stone him once. I lose track of how many times they've tried to kill Jesus. The previous time we read of them trying to stone Jesus was at the end of chapter 8 when Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. They knew what Jesus was claiming. Not only divinity, he was claiming eternality. Before Abraham was, I am. Claiming the divine name for himself. They pick up stones to stone him, but they, they fail in their desire to murder him, to put him to death. And now he says, look, I've shown you many good works from the Father. These are good works that have come from the Father. These are good works that prove that Jesus is come from God, that he is divinely commissioned, divinely empowered to do these things. Listen to what Jesus said, John 5, 36. He says, but the testimony I have is greater than John. For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. These are works of the Father that Jesus is performing. What works is he performing? He's performing works of creation. These are the kinds of miracles, the kinds of signs that John, the gospel writer, records for us. Miracles of creation. He turns water into wine. He, he takes a man who has been an invalid for 38 years and immediately gives him perfect health. Then in chapter nine, there at the beginning of it, Jesus takes a man who was born blind, doesn't heal him, he actually just creates sight for him. In fact, the man who was formerly blind says this about Jesus in chapter nine, verses 20, or 32 through 33. He says, never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind? If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Jesus says, I've shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? Think of what that word good, kalos, means. And, and think about the opposite of it. Jesus said, could have said, think of all the devastating works that I have done from the Father. Could Jesus have proven his divinity through works of devastation? Is this not what God did in, in the book of Exodus? Whereas Jesus turns water into wine, in the book of Exodus, Jesus turned water into blood. Whereas Jesus healed the sick, well, back in the book of Exodus, he gave all of Egypt boils, flies, gnats, covered the land in death. And yet Jesus is performing good works, kind works, you know, works of excellency, works of mercy, works of grace. He's healing people. He's not proving his divinity through these massive acts of judgment. Jesus says, I judge no one. 
I've not come so the world can be condemned. They're already condemned. I've come so that they may have life, life everlasting, life more abundantly. This is the reason I've come. All of the works that Jesus performed during his earthly ministry were great acts of mercy, never giving people what they deserve, only ever withholding judgment and showing people grace. He heals them. He provides for them. He feeds hungry people with, with just a, a handful of loaves and fish. These are all good things. Jesus never speaking a bad word, never doing an act of devastation, never pouring out the wrath of God there ever. He says, for which of these good works are you going to suffer? What kind of hardened, demonic, satanic unbelief has got to be within a person that they want to put Jesus to death? They could have picked up a stone and cast it at anyone in the crowd, and that person would have justifiably died for their sins. And yet the one person who has never sinned, and even beyond that, has only done good works from the Father. He says, for which of these good works are you planning on stoning me? The Jews answered him, verse 33, it is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, for great insult, for slander. Because you, being a man, poieo, you make yourself God. You make yourself God. This is their accusation. And how has he made himself God? By saying, I and the Father are one. They say, you're just a man, and yet you equate yourself with God. So we accuse you of blasphemy. Blasphemy, the sentence for blasphemy is given in Leviticus chapter 24, verse 16. The law reads, whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him, the sojourner as well as the native, when he blasphemes the name, shall be put to death. So they accuse him of blasphemy. As he said in verse 30, I and the Father are one. They say, you're making yourself God. In other words, you are not God, and yet you declare yourself to be something that you are not. In fact, you go way across the line, they say. You declare yourself to be God in the flesh. John chapter 5, verse 18 through 19, this was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, the son does likewise. Jesus never backs off of the claim that he's divine, that he's God in the flesh, that he is the son of God. John 7, 29, and just understand, I eliminated a lot of verses that I had in my notes just for time's sake. John 7, 29, Jesus says, I know him, for I come from him, and he sent me. John 8, 23, right there in the wide open in the city, he said to them, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. The question is, is Jesus making poieo, bringing himself into a condition? Is Jesus making himself God? This is what they don't understand. Jesus is not making himself God. He is God. He's not making himself something or bringing himself into a condition he was not previously occupying. Where they have a hard time is they don't understand how to make sense of divinity wrapped and clothed in humanity. And this is the great mystery. This is the great mystery of Jesus, the Son of God, come in the flesh. That while Jesus did not lay aside any, 
not one aspect of his divinity, of his deity, of his being God, he was still clothed with humanity. That Jesus actually became less by addition. He humbled himself and became lower, not by surrendering his divinity, but by taking on humanity. This is what the Apostle Paul so magnificently describes in Philippians 2. Read it in this light now. Philippians 2, 5 through 8, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. That means leveraged for gain. He doesn't take his divinity and leverage it for gain. This is the kind of humility Jesus is clothed in. But here's what he did, not setting aside his divinity, but he emptied himself, how? By taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And the Jews here, they, Jesus is a stumbling block for them. They cannot in their mind understand that God could become man. They see with their eyes, and yet they do not perceive with their heart. They see what is in front of them, and what do they see? They see a man. Do you know what they don't see? They don't see what the works of Jesus prove about him. They hear what Jesus says, but they don't understand what his words mean. Why? It's not because they can't see. It's not because they can't hear. It's because they can't believe. They cannot believe what they are seeing. They cannot believe what they are hearing. They only respond to what they perceive in their body, what they perceive in their flesh. And even that will not motivate them, as convincing as the proof is, even that will not motivate them to change their mind, to exercise their will and produce belief or faith in their heart. They can't reconcile that Jesus is equal with the Father, divinity in the flesh which is what the gospel writer encapsulated for us so neatly and succinctly in John chapter 1, verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John says we, the apostles, 11 of the 12, that is, we, we perceived his glory. Despite the fact that he's clothed in humanity, we perceived his glory, glory as of the only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. These people don't perceive that. They're picking up stones to put Jesus to death because he says, I and the Father are one. Jesus is going to confound them with the law that they say that they hold dearly, with Moses' law, in fact, with the Psalm of David. Look at what he says here in response to verse 33. The Jews answered him, it is not for a good work that we're going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you being a man make yourself God. Here it is in verse 34. Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law Quote, I said, you are gods. That is a quote, a direct quote from the, the Greek rendering of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, Psalm 82, verse 6. Is it not written in your law, quote, I said, you are gods. That's a plural, that's not a possessive. It's not saying you belong to God. He's saying, you are gods. Whoa, that makes the ground shake beneath our feet, doesn't it? Here is David speaking on behalf 
on behalf of Jehovah, and the Lord himself says of some bodies, you are gods. And as you read that in Psalm 82.6, you see gods is in lowercase. Then the question becomes, how was this first employed? How are we to understand this? How does Jesus mean this to be understood? Here it is. Let's read Psalm 82, verse 1 through 7. You'll see the quote in verse 6. God has taken his place in the divine council, writes David. In the midst of the gods, the lowercase g, he holds judgment. And he says, quote, How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All of the, all of the foundations of the earth are shaken. Why are the foundations of the earth shaken? Because of injustice. Because of a lack of help for the needy and the hurting. And the Lord says to them, he says, I said, you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men you shall die and fall like any prince. So in what sense is the Lord referring to whoever he's talking to as gods? In what sense is he referring to them as gods? Well, in the context of Psalm 82, the reference is to those who have the power to administrate justice. In this sense, they have a godlike responsibility. They have the responsibility to administrate justice. And whereas they have this godlike responsibility, they do not fulfill it. And so he says, nevertheless, like men, all of you are going to die. You are gods, but you fail. You fail to carry out this godlike responsibility given to you. Now, is this all the information that we have as to how to understand this statement? Is Jesus just saying, look, uh, the, the, the law, the, in, in Psalm 82, it says you are gods. You're going to condemn me for saying what's already said in the law? This would be a most base understanding, a most basic understanding, which I find quite insufficient based on the text in John. Continue to look at what Jesus says, and we'll come back to Psalm 82. Verse 34, Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, Psalm 82, 6? I said, You are God's. If he, here's some more information, verse 35, if he, the Father, called them God's, underline it, to whom the word of God came, and Scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? Here, Jesus in verse 35 gives us a bit more insight into whom, to whom Psalm 82 was originally addressed. When you read Psalm 82, you actually do not get this information. What you're reading here in John chapter 10 is Jesus, Jesus knowing exactly whom Psalm 82 was written to and addressing. You know why? Because Jesus is the one who was addressing them. He was there when it was written. In fact, he was there when it was said later to be written. To whom was Psalm 82 recording an address? Look at what it said in verse 35. If he, the Father, called them gods to whom the word of God came. Who was it to whom the word of God came? You could say, well, this is the Jews at large because they've been entrusted with the oracles of God, the word of God. Who specifically did the word of God come to? You know what it came to? It came to those who were brought out of Egypt. They were brought out of Egypt to the foot of Mount Sinai, and there at Mount Sinai, God gave his word. He gave the law to Moses and to all of Israel. 
And he says of them, you are gods. Here's the law. You are gods. Here's the law. Administrate the law. Administrate justice. And what do they do? They fail. Because they don't administrate justice, the foundations of the earth are shaken. And so as punishment for not carrying out this role, he says, nevertheless, like men, you will all die. This is to whom Psalm 82 was written. Now it's going to come into high definition, living color for you. The psalm was written, the saying, you are gods, was given to the Israelites who were brought out of Egypt. And they were brought out of Egypt under the title, under the moniker, as you saw in Exodus chapter 4, verses 22 through 23. You remember what Moses is instructed to say to Pharaoh? He says, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. Let my son go that he may worship me. And if you will not let my son go, I will kill your firstborn son. So what does the Lord say of Israel, whom he brought out of Egypt and gave his word? He says, Israel is my firstborn son. So if the Lord, now you'll understand the point that Jesus is making. He says, if he called them gods to whom the word of God came, those who were brought out of Egypt and given the law and called the firstborn son of God by this work that the father did, if, if he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the son of God? He says, look, the father called Israel, who he brought out of Egypt, gods. He called them his firstborn son. They came out of Egypt. Jesus says, I came out of heaven, not Egypt. They were consecrated through the Red Sea. Jesus was consecrated in heaven itself, sent to earth. Hagiadzo, set apart for a holy work of the Father, consecrated once more and anointed at the baptism of John. As he comes up from the water, not anointed by a priest, but anointed by the Holy Spirit himself, who came down in the likeness of a dove, and the Father declared, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus says, look, if the father said of those brought out of Egypt, you are gods, is it wrong for Jesus to say I am the son of God when he is the one whom the father set apart in heaven, sent to the earth to do his work? Is it not right for him to call himself and declare himself to be the son of God? Well, surely it is. The Father is not referencing the Israelites as gods in the sense that they are deity, but in the sense that they administrate justice. Jesus, however, was not brought out of Egypt. Jesus is sent from heaven itself, consecrated, not in the Red Sea, consecrated by the Father, by the Holy Spirit himself. So he says, why do you have stones in your hand? What have I said that is unjustified? What have I done? What have I implied? What have I said that's blasphemous? Do you say, verse 36, of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world? That means his special messenger into the world. You are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God. Now, we don't have a direct quote of Jesus saying that other than here, but he certainly implied it, didn't he? I am the Father, are one. The Father sent me. He calls himself repeatedly the Son in referring to the Father. Then he says in verse 37, if I'm not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, 
Believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. What does Jesus do here? He, he reduces it down to its most base level. Look, you're sitting here arguing over words, over the word of God. And I say that I and the Father are one, I'm the Son of God, and you say we want to stone you, we want to blast you. He says, look, look, my words are justified. Here's the proof that they're justified. But let's just set all that aside for a moment and let's just look at the easiest thing in the world for people to believe. The easiest thing in the world for people to believe is what they can see with their own eyes. Right? This is the most base level of perception and reception. It's okay. Here's the condition. If I'm doing the works of my Father, or if I'm not doing them, don't believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, even though you don't believe my words, even though you don't believe that I and the Father are one, even though you don't believe Jesus says that I am the Son of God, even though you don't believe my words, he says, believe the works. Believe the works. Believe in what these works imply. What do works of creation imply? Creation is something that only God can do. Only God can turn water into blood or water into wine. Only God can heal a man born blind. Only, only God can raise a man who has been an invalid, a paralytic, for 38 years. He says, look, if you can't hear my words, if you can't understand my words, if you refuse to believe my words, just believe what you can see. Just turn the sound off and watch the picture. Can, can you just believe what you see? He is appealing to their most base level, the basis level of their sensibility. Here's the question then. Would they deny such plain evidence? Would they suppress such plain evidence of Jesus being God in the flesh? Here's the answer to that question. Verse 39, again, they sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. They could care less what he says, or they could not care less I get corrected about that. It bothers some people. They're too picky. They could not care less about what he says. They could not care less about what he does. They can't perceive. They can't see. They can't hear. He says, look, I'm going to appeal to your basis level of sensibility. Would you deny plain evidence? And you know what they say? Yep. Don't care. Why? Why do they not believe? John 10, 24 through 26, Jews gathered around him and he said to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If, if you're the Christ, just tell us plainly. He says, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness about me. But you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. He says, look, just observe the works. And if the works prove to you that I'm God in the flesh, Jesus says, just believe in those works. Why? Look at what he says here in verse 38. Believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. If they were only to believe that, that Jesus is God in the flesh, one with the Father, what would they have? Everlasting life. The most ba faith the size of a mustard seed. Based on their most, their most, the, the smallest amount of faith possible. Amazement at a work. Amazement at a sign. If they just believe what that implies. 
They'll have life everlasting. But they just cannot believe it. And he says, just believe the works that you may know and understand. You know, know and understand here, it's actually the same word. It's the same verb used two times here in different ways, in different tenses. To know is in the aorist. It's the word genosco for both. It's in the aorist. We don't use the aorist term in English language, but essentially what it means is something happened in the past at an indefinite time. It, it just happened. It's not specifying when. It just says it happened. Just believe the works so that you know. You just, at some point, at some point that you just come to understand and know that I'm in the Father and the Father's in me. Or one. God in the flesh. But he says that you may know and understand. Again, that's the same word, genosco, but it's used in the different tense. The first is used in the aorist, a, a completed action at some indefinite point in the past. The present tense means it's an action that continues. Some point, just believe the works that you see and what they imply, that I'm God in the flesh, I and the Father are one. And then after you've come to believe that, just keep believing it. Keep believing it. You know what you have? You have eternal life. Now, how are they gonna respond? This most base level kind of invitation from Jesus. You see, again, you see their response in verse 39. Again, they sought to arrest him, but he escaped their hands. This is now the third time that they've tried to arrest him, according to John's record. He says, look, words aside for now, what do you see? So we don't care about the works. We're not here stoning you because of the works. We're here stoning you for the words. He says, okay, just set the words aside for a minute and look at the works. And what do the works show you? We just want to arrest you. That, that is their response. First observation about the origin of faith, faith comes not by seeing. These people saw all sorts of miracles, all sorts of miracles. They just saw a man who was born blind that they all knew. They just saw him receive sight. They just saw that and they don't care this tells me that the miraculous in the world does not produce faith. Oh God, show me a sign and I'll believe. No, you won't. No, you won't. Lord, if you'll heal my mother, I'll believe. No, you won't. I'll top it. Hey, God, if you'll raise somebody from the dead, I'll believe. I already did that. I already did it. Miracles and signs that the world begs for do not produce faith. These healing ministries, which they always heal people of these psychosomatic issues. They heal people of depression. I want, I want you to go to Texas Children's, have a healing service there in the oncology ward. But they, these are not the kind of healing. They, they want to amaze people because if people see healings, if they see the miraculous, they'll believe. No, they won't. Egypt, and they saw all kinds of miracles they didn't believe. Israel, Israel responded no different than Egypt did. Israel's delivered out and they come to the foot of Mount Sinai after having walked through the Red Sea on dry ground and watching Pharaoh's armies getting buried under the water, drinking water from a rock, eating animals that are just sent there by God, being led by a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day, seeing Moses stick his hand in and out of his cloak and turn it into leprous and healed. And what do they do at the foot of Mount Sinai? They build a golden calf to worship it. What do all of these signs and miracles do? They prove that faith comes not by seeing. 
Faith comes not by seeing. This is startling here, though. Look at verses 40 through 42. Look at the sight of true belief. He went away again across the Jordan to a place where John, to, to the place where John had been baptizing at first. And there he remained. This was Bethany across the Jordan. You read about it in John chapter 1, verse 28. The exact location is somewhat unknown. It seems to be somewhere, most commentators agree, about 13 miles to the northeast of Jerusalem. South of the, the Sea of Galilee, plentiful water, John's baptizing, kind of out in the wilderness, hard to get to, not so enjoyable, not the palatial estate of Jerusalem. Jesus goes back there. Well, when was he there before? He was there at the beginning of his ministry. He went there to John and was baptized by John, and then he left there and he went on his itinerant public ministry. Here what we see is a, a neat little bookend, a bookend to Jesus' public ministry, so to speak. The next time he's going to come into Jerusalem will be the triumphal entry for his time of suffering. He'll come near Jerusalem again, and, and in fact, he'll raise Lazarus from the dead. And you know what that'll produce? More hostility and no belief. So he goes out there back to Bethany, back across the Jordan where John was baptizing. Again, not an attractive place to be. And yet he goes there. Look at what he says. Verse 41. And many came to him. And they said, John did no sign, no miracle. But everything that John said about this man was true. And many believed in him there. Wow. You contrast verse 31 through 39 and verse 40 and 42, 40, 40 through 42. This is night and day. They said, John did no miracle. Jesus appeals to the, the Jews there in Jerusalem. He says, look, just look at the miracles. I've done all sorts of miracles for you. Just look at the miracles. You've got all this preponderance of evidence. Just look at the miracles. What do the miracles imply? Will you just believe with the smallest amount of faith and they say, arrest him? No, we won't believe. Jesus goes out into the wilderness where nobody seemingly wants to be and all kinds of people flock to him. And they go out there and they say, we hadn't seen any miracles. In fact, John did no miracles at all. And yet everything he said about Jesus is true. That about knocked me on my seat. Listen to John's testimony about Jesus. All the things, and this is not all the things that John said about Jesus, but it sure is quite a lofty list. John 1, 29 through 34. The next day, he, John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. That's the same thing Jesus said. Before Abraham was, I am. John was saying it before Jesus did. I myself, John says, I did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. John bore witness, quote, and I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit, and I have seen and borne witness that this is the Son of God. They say, John didn't do any miracles, but everything John said about Jesus is true. What are they affirming? They're affirming, based on the word of God, preached by the man of God, that Jesus is the son of God. This is what they're affirming. Hadn't seen a miracle. 
That's not all John said. John 3, 31 through 36. He says, he who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal on this, that God is true. For he whom God sent utters the words of God. For he gives the spirit without measure. The father loves the son and has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. This was John the Baptist's testimony. And all these people in the wilderness say, we hadn't seen John do a single sign, but we believe every word he says about Jesus. And yet the people in Jerusalem, they've seen all sorts of sign, and they can't believe one word said by John or Jesus. Interesting. These people in the wilderness haven't seen a thing, and yet they believe everything. The people in Jerusalem saw everything, and yet they don't believe a thing. Faith comes not by seeing. Where did the faith of these in the wilderness who came to Jesus, where did it come from? Observation number two. Faith comes by hearing and hearing of the word of God. You know what John was out there doing? He was preaching the word of God. As, as God's prophet, he was preaching the word of God. People heard it, people believed, and they're baptized. Their faith came through the word. Jesus says to the people in Jerusalem, you are so depraved and unregenerate, you can't even hear the word, so could you just see something and believe? No. We've seen it all. We won't believe, and they won't. If a person will not believe the word of God, they will not believe even if they saw someone rise from the dead. Faith comes not by seeing. Faith comes from hearing and hearing of the word of God. This is exactly what the apostle Paul taught in Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Here is where our imperative comes in. We want, we want family members to believe. We want co-workers to believe. How are they going to believe unless we speak the word of God to them? Unless we tell them the words of Christ. Listen to the quandary the apostle Paul finds himself in theologically in Romans chapter 10, verse 14 through 15. He says, how then will they call on him whom they've not believed? And how are they to believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? How are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. We are not responsible for bringing about faith in someone's heart but we are responsible for preaching the word of God to them. We are not responsible for performing miracles. Miracles aren't gonna produce faith in anyone anyway. We're responsible for preaching the word of God, telling people about Jesus, who he is. This is what John did, right? He didn't do any miracles. He said, Jesus is the lamb of God. He died for the sins of the world. He's eternal. He's before me. He ranks before me. The Father anointed him by his own Holy Spirit. Jesus is the Son of God. And all these people just believe. No, they don't need any sign. Why? Well, faith doesn't come by seeing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing of the word of God. Now, does this mean that everyone who hears the word of God is going to believe? No, because here's another interesting reality. All of these people in Jerusalem, they just heard Jesus do some of the most incredible teaching that has ever been done on this planet. 
Took me four weeks just to do a scratching the surface kind of sermons on Jesus' discourse about being the good shepherd. And all these people heard it, and yet they didn't believe. Observation number three. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the help of God. No faith comes by seeing. All faith comes by hearing, and hearing of the word of God. But not all who hear the word of God believe. Ultimately, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the help of God. John 10, 25 through 26. In fact, Jesus just said this to these people. I told you, here it is, words, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. In John eight forty seven. whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. We need help. We don't need only to hear the Bible. We actually need the help of God to receive the Bible. Unbelievers understand. They can understand God's word, but they can never receive God's word without the help of God. This is the miracle that is needed. Not one that can be perceived by sight, but one that takes place in the heart. But that miracle does not take place apart from the word of God. Here is the divine, mysterious tension between God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. We have the responsibility to declare the truth of God. We do not have the ability to make it effective. Yet we're responsible nonetheless. Even Jesus declared the word of God and it was not believed at times. But it was always believed by those who are his sheep. Why? John 6, 63. It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. This is why the people seeing no signs believed and the people who saw all the signs didn't believe. Why? It's the spirit who gives life, not the eyes, not the mind. 1 Corinthians 2, 14. The natural person does not accept the things of God, of the spirit of God, for their folly, their foolishness to him, and he's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. What's the outcome of this? It's not just that we know these truths. Faith does not come by seeing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the help of God. These are wonderful truths. These are amazing truths. What is the outcome in our hearts? The first outcome should be worship. It should be worship. Thankfulness to God for the heart to believe. Thankfulness to God for the faith to believe. God, thank you for not leaving me, leaving me in the hardness of my unbelieving heart. Thank you for softening my heart, for opening my eyes. Hey, Brennan just got up here and just gushed about Jesus. Just how beautiful Jesus is. How do, you, how do you do that? And on the other hand, in the world, you have people who use Jesus' name as a cuss word. Paul, I thank God that he opens your eyes to see the beauty of Christ. Because he could have left you blind from birth. But he didn't. So then, the first response is worship. The second response is obedience to our responsibility. Faith doesn't come by seeing. That's a great help for us because there's nothing I can do to impress anybody. But faith comes by hearing and hearing of the word of God. And here's where I come into play. All I can do is tell people 
who Jesus is and what he's done for them. It's all I can do, but it is what I must do. Faith does not come apart from hearing the word of God. It always comes through the hearing of the word of God. That's our responsibility. And in the end, we understand that if a person believes, it's not because we made such a convincing argument. It's certainly not because we did something that wowed them. They believe because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the help of God. It ultimately came the same way that the ability to believe came to you as a gracious gift of God. Jesus coming along the way, seeing a man born blind and saying, you wanna see? Then healing. The fact is, is we see here that we have a tremendous responsibility, as strange as it is, we have this tremendous responsibility to be part of the work of God. God could have ordained that we not be part of his work at all, but he has. What will you do with that responsibility? My prayer this morning, and I hope it's the prayer in your heart, is that you'll be faithful. Don't put the weight of creating faith on your shoulders because you can't do that. But take up the mantle, take up the responsibility of telling people about Jesus and leave the miraculous up to God. He's able. Would you pray with me?